neurogen, neurogenic inflammation is, is good if it stays acute. It can help uh, mold the, the peripheral tissue into something that's, that's healthy. Uh, but as it, prolonged, as it is prolonged, it becomes very harmful. And one of the reasons it becomes harmful is because it changes uh, the characteristic of one group of, of afferents that we're going to call silent nociceptors. So it's the easiest way to convey this um, is to tell you the story of how silent nociceptors were discovered. So people were looking at the knee joint to try and understand arthritis. And they found primary afferents that they could stimulate. They could stimulate in the knee joint and record. They could find the, the, the afferents that innervated the knee joint but nothing that they did to the knee joint would get those afferents excited. They could bend the knee joint this way, that way. Uh, uh, anything that they did, the, the afferent was silent. But it, did, it was there because when they shocked it using electrical stimulation, they could see that it was there. So then they put in what we would call inflammatory soup. And inflammatory soup is all that stuff that we just looked at the bradykine and the serotonin, the protons, the potassium, all that stuff, all that stuff that is present in um, injured tissue. And what they saw over the course of a 10, 12 hour experiment was that over time, over the course of, of just a few hours, these previously silent nociceptors started to fire. They started to fire when the knee bent or when the knee was extended or when the knee was twisted a little bit, um, or they start to fire spontaneously. And this has been an incredibly um, uh, remarkable uh, finding, um, and it has told us that these silent nociceptors are probably uh, responsible for a lot of the chronic pain in these chronic inflammatory diseases, such as arthritis. Arthritis is, is one of the most common uh, problems that virtually everyone has a little bit of by the time they get to my age. Um, and so uh, it's, it's not that you can, uh, it's not that you have an ongoing stimulus, it's that you have changed the response properties of the afferents that serve that part of the body. That's hard to undo. And so what we really want to do is um, prevent that from happening to begin with. OK, so now what let's talk about is what can happen as inflammation goes on. It can move from being in a situation of acute pain to a situation of chronic pain. And there are, besides inflammation, there are two other conditions that can move from uh, an acute stage to a chronic stage. And that the other ones are nerve injury, direct injury of a nerve. And the final one is deafferentation. And what deafferentation means is simply that you've interrupted the pathway, the ascending pathway, the information in. You've interrupted the input at some point. So one example is uh, amputation. If you take off a limb, you've interrupted the, the peripheral nerve pathway. Another example is uh, an, a, a, um, if there's a spinal cord lesion, you've interrupted the, say, the spinal thalamic tract pathway. Okay, so, and, and a third example of a deafferentation um, injury would be a stroke up in thalamus, in the part of thalamus that responds to uh, uh, noxious stimulus, or mass sensory stimulus, the ventrobasal uh, thalamus. So the important point here is that chronic pain is, is not simply the same as acute pain, but more longstanding. It is a different beast. You have crossed a bridge. You have changed the nature of the signaling. And the, the change takes place centrally. And this is uh, uh, what we know from peripheral nerve injury, this is, but this is basically the same thing as thought to happen in these other uh, conditions as well. So under normal circumstances, there is no spontaneous activity in a nociceptor.
Um, and there's no spontaneous activity in a dorsal horn cell that is going to give rise to a spinothalamic tract cell. So normally there's no activity. And when there's tactile stimulation, there's still, there's a, there may be a response because there's convergence onto the cell, but there's no action potential. And it takes an action, it takes noxious stimulation to elicit an action potential. Now, after a barrage of noxious stimulation, and that can come from uh, a really uh, bad trauma, or it can come from uh, inflammatory soup that the experimenter put there. Regardless of what the barrage came from, what happens after this uh, barrage, this cell is now trained to be much more responsive to anything that comes into it, whether it's low threshold information or high threshold information, whether it's information sh that should normally not make this cell respond or information that should make this cell respond. So spontaneously, it's now firing. This can give rise. When this happens, that is, a, is gonna cause a spontaneous experience of pain. Tactile stimulation can make this cell fire as well, and that's gonna cause allodynia. And finally, noxious stimulus will not just give rise to a, a reasonable response, but will give rise to a much more, uh, a much augmented response, and that will give rise to hyperalgesia. So at this point, we've crossed a bridge, and the problem here is that we no longer have a focus. We can no longer throw NSAIDs at this. We can no longer make sure that the, the, the whatever is um, damaging or exciting the, the primary afferents, we can no longer take that out and, and expect to recover. Now we have a situation that, that, is, that is blind to any stimulus. This could happen without a stimulus, and, in, and this is the definition of neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain means pain that does not depend on a stimulus. So. An example, the, a really obvious example of this is deafferentation pain, uh, 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 amputation pain. So if you have no leg, but the leg hurts, that's a neuropathic pain. You can't, there's no stimulus for that. The pain is completely, obviously, in your neocortex. That's where pain is. But in this situation, it's, it's coming in and, uh, and there's no stimulus. And so the, you can't treat it with NSAIDs. And in point of fact, the best treatment for acute pain uh, is, is opioids. Is a class of drugs called uh, uh, opioids or, or commonly thought of as narcotics, and, uh, and, such as morphine. Um, but morphine doesn't, in general, work on the, these uh, neuropathic pains. And so we have it, neuropathic pain is where uh, where the chronic pain uh, situation has become so difficult to treat because we do not have great ways to treat it. There are some drugs such as anticonvulsants and antidepressants um, that, that work not through their anticonvulsant or antidepressant mechanism but through a different mechanism to dampen down um, type, some types of neuropathic pain. But in general, this is a big challenge for the future, particularly in, um, in relationship to the opioid epidemic that is present, at least in the United States of America. So now we're going to take a brief foray into visceral pain.